Welcome to Mexico Unexplained, where we will explore the magic, the mysteries, and the miracles of Mexico. This series presents information based partly on theory and conjecture. The podcaster's purpose is to suggest some possible explanation, but not necessarily the only ones to the subjects we will examine. Here is your host, Robert Bito. Welcome, and muy bienvenidos to episode number 149 of Mexico Unexplained where we examine the magic, the mysteries, and the miracles of Mexico. I'm your host, Robert Bitto. The date was July 4, 1831. On the sprawling Hacienda de San Marcos, in the central Mexican state of Aguas Calientes, a baby boy was born. The boy was the son of a common laborer on the Hacienda's land, a woman named Ignacia Chavez. Ignacia's family welcomed the baby boy even though Ignacia had no husband. The boy's father was the wealthy Don Juan Davalos of the neighboring Hacienda de Penuelas. Ignacia named the boy Juan in honor of his father, but because he was what was termed at the time a natural child, baby Juan could not inherit his real father's name or any of the wealth associated with being a Davalos by blood. The young Juan Chavez would grow up on the neighboring hacienda forever feeling frustrated that he could not partake in a life he felt he should have had, living in the opulent ranch house and having command over land and laborers. Instead, the life that Juan imagined he should have had was lived by his half-brother, Romualdo Davalos, whom Juan often saw riding his horse on the hacienda lands like a young prince. Juan's frustrations and his feelings of thwarted greatness made thoughts of being a hacienda laborer unbearable to him by the time he was an adolescent. Sometime in his late teens, Juan Chavez took up with a small band of miscreants and left the ranch lands for a life as a petty highwayman, robbing travelers throughout the state of Aguas Calientes and into the neighboring states of Jalisco and Zacatecas. By his early twenties, Juan Chavez was well on his way to becoming a legend in central Mexico. He had teamed up with other local legends, Dionisio Perez and the Spanish-born Maximo Gonzalez, and with these two, Chavez's raids became more daring and bolder. His band of outlaws started looting businesses and homes of towns in broad daylight, not restricting their activities to small farms or rural back roads. The Chavez bandits even rode into the capital of the state, also called Aguas Calientes, and burned down the municipal archives in 1862. By the early 1860s, the downtrodden and poor people of the state began to look up to Chavez and admired him for trying to upset the status quo by going after high-profile targets among the government and the wealthy elite. Juan Chavez had a keen knack for evading justice and had spent well over a decade successfully dodging local and federal authorities. Around campfires throughout central Mexico, people began telling stories about him and sang songs to this clever outlaw. The many legends of Juan Chavez and Corridas sung about his exploits survive to this day not only in Aguas Calientes but into the broader Mexican national culture. The press at the time had two nicknames for him, Idolo de las Beatas or Rojas de los Mochos. The first nickname, Idolo de las Beatas or Idol of the Blessed Ones in English, came from his rejection of government reforms restricting the power of the church in Mexico. The second nickname, Rojas de los Mochos, has no easy translation into 21st century English and may loosely refer to the bloody end of a butt of a rifle. The liberal press at the time painted Juan Chavez as a conservative, which he was. The legendary bandit seemed more aligned with the political beliefs of his natural father, the hacienda owner Juan Davalos, and the landed gentry of the area which disliked ever-increasing control from the central government in Mexico City. Banditry has existed throughout Mexican history in times and areas in which highly unequal socioeconomic conditions existed combined with lax government law enforcement. 
Much of rural Mexico in the 19th century was left to fend for itself, and besides the clerical class, there were basically two classes of people in most of the Mexican countryside, the landed gentry and the peones, the landless peasants who worked the land in a state of semi-servitude. Many clever men of low birth but with high ambition turned to banditry to become upwardly mobile and gain the wealth and status afforded to others by mere birth. The bandits became legends because many landless and powerless people in the countryside desired a better life and to break free from their circumstances but didn't for one reason or another. Bandits, while often violent and outside the law, became folk heroes, a resistance made up of ordinary people fighting an unjust system in all of its dimensions. Local governments in Mexico tried combating banditry, but it was an uphill battle. Juan Chavez's own state of Aguas Calientes issued a decree in October of 1859 compelling hacienda owners to do their part in helping keep the peace in the rural areas. The state required each hacienda owner to assign a contingent of men, quote, to protect the security of the respective farms and to constitute a useful force to carry out their defense and persecution of the bandits, end quote. It took a year for Esteban Avila, the governor of the state of Aguas Calientes, to enforce the rural militia law. The hacendados agreed reluctantly to contribute three or four men apiece to form what was called the reform squadrons. These forced volunteer squadrons proved ineffective. Governor Avila came up with a new plan by 1862. The state of Aguas Calientes would grant amnesty to all bandits who would turn themselves in, swear an oath to give a banditry, and return to private life. Governor Avila had Juan Chavez in mind when he put forth the proposal. Surprisingly, upon hearing the offer, Juan Chavez accepted and swore to remain, quote, peacefully in the domestic home, end quote. Chavez's adult life had never been peaceful, however, and the former bandit soon grew restless. While contemplating a return to his former ways, Juan Chavez received a proposition from the Aguas Calientes governor to fill a new position. The governor offered Chavez a commission to head the Ocampo Squadron, a quasi-military force organized by the state to hunt down the remaining bandits who did not agree to Avila's terms of amnesty. In another surprise, Chavez accepted this, and the once chief bandit of the state of Aguas Calientes became its chief bandit hunter. Things were going well for Juan Chavez. His Ocampo squadron cleaned up the countryside and he was hailed as a different type of hero. This too would change within the year, though. Chavez's relations with the state government deteriorated when the president of Mexico, Benito Juarez, forced Esteban Avila to leave the government. President Juarez appointed the liberal-leaning Ponciano Arriaga to the position of governor until elections could be held later that year. On October 20, 1862, José María Chávez Olonso became the new governor. Chávez Olonso, a former editor of newspapers and magazines and one of the authors of the Aguas Caliente State Constitution, did not see eye to eye with the former bandit Juan Chávez. The month after the new governor took power, Juan Chavez was back to his former profession. The ex-bandit turned bandit hunter turned bandit saw a wider trajectory for the rest of his life, however. His taste of state and national politics opened up a broader world to him. This was all happening during a very volatile time in Mexican history. Earlier in 1862, on May 5th, in fact... A French invasion force was defeated by the Mexicans in the Battle of Puebla, but the French had not given up on their designs for Mexico. The conservatives and the wealthy elites who despised the Juarez presidency wanted the French intervention in Mexico. Juan Chavez, who had always identified with the conservatives, thought of joining up with the French to help overthrow the liberal government of Aguas Calientes. Without French help and together with dozens of his former bandit comrades, 
On November 23, 1862, Juan Chavez occupied the city of Aguas Calientes, the biggest city and the capital of the state. His hold on the city didn't last long, and he retreated to the countryside. Powerful conservatives and those who backed the French intervention in Mexico had heard of Juan Chavez's exploits in the state of Aguas Calientes and sent a military advisor named Valeriano Larumbide to impose order and discipline on the different groups of rebels who had sympathy with the conservatives and the interventionists. On February 13, 1863, the former bandit Juan Chavez along with Valeriano Larumbide and their small rebel army ransacked the city of Aguas Calientes and left it in ruin. They did not occupy it, but Larumbide immediately began construction of military barracks and fortifications outside the city. Fighting continued between government-backed liberals and French-backed conservatives throughout 1863. While fighting continued sporadically throughout 1863 in the state of Aguas Calientes, there were massive changes underway in national politics. By June 1863, the French army had occupied Mexico City and proclaimed a military junta and then a provisional government. The Juarez government fled to El Paso, Texas to operate in exile. By October of 1863, after the Catholic Empire of Mexico had been proclaimed, the newly created Crown of Mexico was offered to Maximilian von Habsburg, a younger brother of the Emperor of Austria, Franz Joseph I. Napoleon III of France brokered this deal. With Mexico City under foreign occupation and the French army taking control of surrounding Mexican states, by the end of 1863, the legendary bandit Juan Chavez found himself in the middle of history. The French had complete control of the state of Aguas Calientes by December of 1863, and the military commanders wanted to appoint a loyal local to administer their newly conquered territory. They turned to Juan Chavez. On December 21, 1863, Juan Chavez the bandit became governor of Aguas Calientes. He immediately adopted the motto, Long live religion, long live the regency of the empire, and proceeded to dismantle many of the supposed reforms enacted by the liberal government before him. In February of 1864, the French army returned to Aguas Calientes, thanked Juan Chavez for his service, and replaced him with a man named Sayetano Basave. The former bandit did not feel slighted at the replacement. He did not prefer the life of a politician, so upon leaving the governorship, he rejoined the interventionists led by the French and pursued his former foes, the former liberal leaders of his home state. At the Battle of Jerez, forces led by Juan Chavez captured the former Aguas Calientes governor, José María Chavez Alonso. The former governor was taken to the city of Zacatecas and faced a firing squad a few days later in the town of Malpaso. As a reward for his valor and dedication, in July of 1864, Emperor Maximilian called Juan Chavez to Mexico City to give his personal thanks to the former bandit. Juan Chavez knelt before the European monarch and accepted a jewel-encrusted sword for his service to the empire. As history records, the empire would not last, and eventually forces loyal to the liberals and the Mexican Republic regained control of the country. By 1867, the French intervention was over. Juan Chavez again returned to his old ways and lived with the bandits in the hills of Aguas Calientes, preying on travelers and occasionally looting businesses and government offices. In February of 1868, the new governor of the state, a man named Jesus Gomez Portugal, offered a bounty for the head of Juan Chavez and issued a decree to seize all his assets to be sold off at auction. Juan Chavez proved as elusive as he always had been. Throughout 1868, the local Aguas Calientes press speculated on his whereabouts. Some sightings put him in Jalisco, others in Zacatecas, while others said he had fled to the rugged mountains of San Luis Potosí. On February 15, 1869, the fans and foes of Juan Chavez would know of his fate. 
On the road to the town of Arona, Chavez had an argument with two of the members of his bandit troop, Viviano Nieves and Agaton Chavez. On the night of February 14, 1869, the two murdered the famous bandit while he slept. The story of the legendary bandit Juan Chavez does not end with his untimely death at the age of 37. Soon after his death, people began wondering what happened to the massive amounts of loot that Juan Chavez had acquired during his nearly two decades of being a bandit. What happened to some of his personal property, like the jeweled sword presented to him by Emperor Maximilian? Rumors swirled around Aguas Calientes and the surrounding states, and only grew more intense and more far-fetched over time. One of the rumors persisting many years after his death, which may have basis in fact, had to do with a secret tunnel system in two hilly areas the bandit frequented. The stories came out decades after Juan Chavez's passing, mostly coming from deathbed tales from former bandit associates and surviving relatives of those who rode with him. In one account, the tunnels were large enough to ride into with a horse, and they went into the hillsides for miles. While this supposed tunnel network may have been a system of yet undiscovered caves, some have speculated that the tunnel system belonged to a lost indigenous race, or even an underground civilization of surviving ancient Maya. The tunnel system explains the ease by which Juan Chavez eluded authorities during the height of his bandit days. Many treasure hunters have tried to find these secret hiding places with no luck. Perhaps Juan Chavez gave orders to his associates to seal off the caves in the event of his untimely death. Perhaps the tunnel system is just part of the ever-growing legend of the bandit. We are still left with unanswered questions regarding the whereabouts of the loot, if there was any hidden treasure to begin with. The secret wealth aside, Juan Chavez remains one of the most little-known but fascinatingly colorful figures in all of Mexican history. Thank you once again for listening to another episode of Mexico Unexplained. Remember to like and subscribe to us on YouTube and follow us on Twitter. Tell your friends by sharing these shows with others. Please go to our website, MexicoUnexplained.com, for references, illustrations, and for free access to transcripts of past shows. Please visit Amazon.com to purchase the book, Mexico Unexplained, to get a hard copy of The Magic, The Mysteries, and The Miracles of Mexico. We appreciate your kind attention once again. Until next time, thank you and gracias. Thank you for listening to another episode of Mexico Unexplained with host Robert Bitto. For show summary, relevant links, and commentary, please check out our website at MexicoUnexplained.com. Like us on Facebook and be a part of the conversation. Adios and hasta la vista.